So everything I think it's recorded. All right, here we go. Michael McRae, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you on, although slightly, um, the stories in your book are really uncomfortable for me over the last few months living in America with everything going on to really talk about as two white guys talking about it. But either way, <laughs> yeah, um, either way, the nice thing is they're not really your stories. Um, so that, that helps a little bit. So uh, one of the questions I like to ask people every single time I start is if I was to ask you or you were telling somebody, hey, I'm Michael, these are the things that actually make me me. Not that I'm a husband, that's the, that's the trite elevator pitch that anybody could say, you know, I'm a son or whatever. Like, what are the important things as you look back over the course of your life, however old you happen to be, that you're yeah. like, yeah, these are the things that actually make me do what I do now, that drive you? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, uh, well, firstly, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, mm -hmm. What, yeah, what makes me me? I, um, for as long as I can remember, I have wanted people's attention. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a, three, I'm a three on the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so I can, yeah, I just always remember trying to be in the spotlight. Um, now I've learned how to tame that a bit more as I've gotten older, <laughs> but, uh, and control it but the the drive is always still there like am i building a big enough platform how many people are liking posts like it's still very much about like being seen um mm -hmm. so that's yeah that's definitely something that's there um and then in a less kind of vulnerable level i suppose the um yeah i've always had a very deep love of stories so mm -hmm. um you know early on that was looking like uh you know, Disney movies or Lord of the Rings or whatever it was. And I needed to, I always had to act out, I had a very vivid imagination. So I, I always needed to act out every story that I encountered. So my parents had to start like really being careful about what stories I actually got to see, like uh, what movies we watched. Cause then I would go just like act them all <laughs> out, and, you know, try to fly or something after watching Peter Pan. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I, I've always had a deep love of, of stories and, and I've always been, I've always been a really, empathic person um and um wanted wanted to be in kind of community and sharing things with people my mom would tell a story about how when i was five i think it was my birthday and i have an older brother and that when i came down for my birthday and saw my presents i said i said john john look what we got uh, even though it was my birthday but my sense was like these presents are for all of us like yeah. so that's that's also been I think part of who I am is I have a sense of wanting to connect to the pain of other people and mm -hmm. um, wanting to be part of, of healing in some way, which has led me to most of the work that I've done throughout my life, I think. Yeah. Did John feel the same way when it was his birthday? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, John's a one of the man, so he's very much just like, this is mine, this is not yours, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I uh, I made a commitment to both myself and my family to slow down in the summer. Last summer about broke me recording episodes week after week because up until three days ago, today's Wednesday, right? Thursday, up until Monday, I had not missed a week for like two and a half years. Um, and wow. It's just a lot of, yeah. Uh, and I, I refuse to talk to people if I don't read their book, at least if that's what we're talking about. If it's not a book, it actually requires more work because there's you did the outline you did a great job like, you know so um although those are some of my favorite they just take a lot more work it was exhausting and so i told my wife I was like you know when the summer comes which actually hit a little earlier i kept the school school year summer it's like i'm only going to do one every other week mm -hmm. because of that though i've only you're only the second person i've talked to this month the last person was a three when i told him it was a five and then i started asking questions he kept blowing me up saying yeah, not everybody needs all the answers. Like, I understand that you've got to read 97 books. He's like, and that tells me something about you. We'll talk about that for a minute. Yeah. However, th the question doesn't hold as much weight for me. And that's a paraphrase of what he said. And I'm like, that's fair. Can we talk about it, though? <laughs> you know, he's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when uh, I think it was the publisher or the the person reached out and said hey do you want to speak with Michael I read a little bit about the blurb of your book I read a little bit about some of the other stuff that you've written about as well was really excited 
and then you alluded to it a minute ago. Uh, I don't know if I was recording yet or not. Um, but yeah, the, the, the lady had said, well, he just had a baby. Can we hit pause for a minute? So congratulations on the baby. You're yeah. absolutely right. You're, you're never going to sleep again. But like I told you earlier, you'll just stop caring if the house is clean. So it gets easier. Um, you'll get a minivan. It's going to be fine. They're really great. Utilitarian. It's perfect. I wouldn't trade mine in for the world. My wife drives the sexy car and I drive the minivan every <laughs> single day. So right. you... um. I have questions about your book. So your book is called I Am Not Your Enemy, and it is laced with stories that predominantly are not yours. Really, when your voice kind of comes into view, it's, it's more of a segue to the next story or a fleshing out of, of a larger conversation. So how did you come about wanting, how did this come about? Like in the back of my mind, I can see questioning everything and then not doing anything with that information. So what in somebody makes you want to go okay, I need to basically go across the continents, all of them, and talk to all these people and then yeah. somehow flesh it out into paper. Like, how does that happen? Yeah, the, the original impetus for the book, um, well, it, it, first of all, it was not, I had no intention of writing a book initially. In fact, every book that I published did not start out writing a book. Um, my, my first book was just... Um, kind of letters I was writing to people back home when I was living in the West Bank. And then my second book was a master's thesis that I expanded. And then my, the third one was an advent reader that I did on my blog that turned into a publication. And then the fourth is, is this one. Mm. Uh, started out as, it actually started out as a, as a, a proposal for a Fulbright fellowship um, where I, it, Michael Brown had just been killed in Ferguson and um uh, Israel was bombarding Gaza. ISIS was in the news all the time. And it was an overwhelming amount of just terrible news. And I had a sense of, like, we, we need to find the stories that we tell matter. The stories that we tell directly affect the breadth of our imagination. And if we, the way that we tell stories will inform our ability to, to engage the world. It, it provides a framework for us. And so we've got to be really intentional at telling stories um, and listening to stories that point us out of violence and not just keep us stuck in cycles of violence. Um, and I'd spent a lot of time in Israel, Palestine, you know, I'd made a dozen trips or so. Um, you know, I'd done grad school in Northern Ireland and, and conflict resolution. So I had connections in those places. I'd studied a lot about South Africa and knew some people there, but hadn't been. And so I put together this proposal to say, you know what, what I, what I want to do is actually go to places that are known for their division um, and talk to people who are finding ways to live well together in the midst of that division um, and see what wisdom they have for the wounds that we have back home. Um, and by the time I got around to doing the project, Donald Trump was rising to, you know, in the Republican um, uh, uh, primary. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and my sense was people, especially a lot of white people were being like, wait, what is happening? And, and there was just like, I didn't realize that Obama was just president. I thought we were done with race. And like, it was sort of this sense of this, the country's not where we thought it was. And so I, I wanted to go and find these stories to, to say, this feels really new to us maybe in the United States, even though it shouldn't, but it does feel new to us in the States. Well, people in other places have been dealing with this for a very long time. And what do they have to say that we need to hear? Um, and so it started out as an educational collaboration with, the, with Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. And the, but as I was gathering these stories and sending them to students to, to engage with, I had this sense of um, these can't be limited to this one project. I've got to, these stories are too compelling and I wanna tell them. And now the big task then was taking the 60 or 70 interviews that I did and turning them into only 10 chapters. Huh. You know, so there, I had to cut out most of the stories, um, but the, the ones that made their way into the book, I think were really, really powerful ones and yeah now i really want to read the other 50 but that, that'll be <laughs> that'll be volumes uh, maybe we'll talk about the other 50 if it comes up so i'm curious so the students at the uh tcu i'm from texas um that's the bullfrog horn frogs green horn frogs. frogs horn frogs yeah yeah um did what how did these stories or did you have a line of sight like were you teaching there or were you sending these to a professor like how did these stories flesh out kind of the views of the students there? Like, did you get any communication back from that of lives impacted in real time? 
Yeah, I guess some. I was partnering with, um, I was a, technically called, was called a visiting scholar, but they were trying this reverse model where instead of bringing the scholar to campus, you send them abroad and then you interact through technology. Mm -hmm. So um, I partnered with a political science class, a, a world religions class, and a, um, a world literature class. And so, uh, yeah, they, some of the students would just, I would post some of the pieces to my blog and they would comment. I would post short little Instagram stories of some of the, of the ones that are in the book and then students would comment on that. And then they also um, they had to make video projects based on, because I also filmed, I filmed all the interviews. So I had like 180 gigabytes of footage of all the, of the whole trip. And so students also would watch the, 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 the interviews that I did and they'd make videos from them. And so there was, there was quite a, a bit of, um, uh, of interaction. And um, overall, I mean, it seemed like this, the students were really taken with the stories. There were definitely some students that couldn't care less, but you know, right. there were a lot of students who, whether it was kind of like, I had no idea that was happening in Israel and Palestine, or, um, oh my goodness, how does someone ever forgive someone who killed their father? Uh, or, uh, or also saying, this reminds me of, of like what it's like to be a black person in America, you know, like, and so there were all those sorts of conversations that happened. And then I got to come back at the end of the trip. I was gone for three months. I came back and spent a week at TCU interacting with the students in person. And so that was a really, really meaningful engagement as well. But it was really through those, those conversations and being on campus with everybody um, and, and talking in person about the stories that made me think, I think this is going to end up being a book. Um, but that was in 2015. So it took, four or five years to get the whole thing together. So. Goodness, goodness. Yeah, the, um, yeah, I would assume a visiting scholar is not paid the same as a tenured scholar on campus then. That, that was, that's, that's why they send you abroad. They pay for your passport and they just yeah. send you off. They funded the whole project, I'll give them that. They, they funded, I had no expenses while I was there, but I didn't make a lot of money. Um, yeah, well, that's, I guess that's not nothing. Um, so you said, uh, the, I don't, I'm not good with words. The word this, the word that, you talked a little bit about race, you talked a little bit about someone's murder or, or, or a killing of a, of a family member um, in Israel and Palestine. So can you name a little bit of what you mean when you say this or that? Just because most of the people listening to this will most likely not have read your book. So yeah. can you name what you mean when you say those two things? Um, well, I don't remember exactly what I was just referencing when I said this or that. <laughs> I was thinking of a lot of things, but I, yeah. I mean, I can give sort of uh, some quick examples of stories, but if you can remind me what I was talking about, I can. Yeah. Tell you. So you talked, oh, you talked about kind of, um, you wanted to talk about the stories in the book and how it reminded you a lot of what is happening right now. Oh yeah. Um, uh, and then you said, you know, like, like things like this and like things like that. Uh, and then you referenced Israel and Palestine, someone having a family member get passed away and, and uh, being reminded of being black in America right now. Yeah. Um, so just for those that haven't read the book, um, I'm not, I'm not being naive. I, I've read the book. <laughs> uh, if you were to say this or that as a, as a theme of the book, what are you trying to get at when you say this or that? You're talking about struggle, you're talking about trauma, you're talking yeah. about racism. Like, what are we talking about? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, it's some of all that. I don't, I don't deal too, I don't deal at great length with the issue of like American racism, but what mm -hmm. I do try to talk about is um, look at the particular stories in these places and see kind of what, what universal applicability they have, or at least even what particular applicability they have to, to our own context. And so um, in places like Israel and Palestine, you're dealing with issues of oppression, you're dealing with issues of occupation, you have one group that has power over another in a very real way, in this sense, Israeli uh, control over Palestinian life, which I know many people want to debate, um, but it's, it's just a fact. It is what it is. Yeah. It's just a fact. Um, and, uh, and so that dynamic is similar in a lot of ways to the United States. And the more that I've traveled in Israel and Palestine, the more I've seen the parallels between Israel's occupation of the West Bank and the way in which police uh, control black neighborhoods and it's become more and more obvious to me mm. um, and what I think we're seeing now in a lot of ways is a black intifada which is an Arabic term it comes from out of the Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict that over the 50 over the 60 70 years of Israel's occupation of the West Bank um, there have been two major uh, what are called Palestinian intifadas which in Arabic means shaking off they're an uprising a major national uprising um, one in the 80s and 90s that was primarily kind of um, uh, organized civil disobedience, uh, boycotts, strikes, sit-ins, things like that. And the late early 2000s, it was suicide bombing. So it was, it was terrorist tactics. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, but it was a response to this feeling of control. And that's what I think is, is happening in the United States right now when and Minneapolis and all cities across the United States essentially is that there's this sense to which um, black Americans in particular are, are sh trying to shake off the control of white supremacy in the United States and are feeling done. And so those theme that that type of um, struggle was evident in a lot of the stories, you know, there was there was a conversation in chapter two where I talk with a guy who, who does a lot of um, work with trauma, who talks about uh, how the Palestinian people have no PTSD because um, he says there is actually no post-trauma here. We, we face the same trauma every day, so we don't actually mm -hmm. heal from our trauma. We have to learn how to cope with our trauma. And that was another parallel that I, um, that I could imagine was true. I'm not a black person in America, but if you pay attention there's a sense to which yeah. there's not a lot of healing that can be done because you how could you ever truly feel safe so it's i think those are some of the themes that i that came up um, yeah yeah one of my past guests um i was going to have him back on earlier this year and then he decided to run for president so i've had mark charles on way back in the, oh, yeah. in the, in the yeah i love mark Mark's great yeah one of the things that is he said and he said a lot of times since then uh it really struck with me stuck stuck with me that's the word i'm looking for um, is you, you can't have a conversation about reconciliation when there's never actually been conciliation. So first we have to have conciliation before we can even talk about reconciliation because we can't pretend like it ever happened. This has never been a conversation that we've had at all. Um, it's really struck with me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that was, we could talk a lot about the theme of reconciliation. Yes. The there were lots of conversations about that. There's one chapter called When Reconciliation Means Nothing. Um, which was a conversation with a, a woman of color in South Africa. Yeah. And the basic summary is that she was saying in all her work, reconciliation means nothing if it's not built upon a platform of social justice. If there's not a, if there's not a foundation in the case in, in a South African context, which is actually quite similar to a U.S. context, if the idea of reconciliation is not is not built upon ideas like black empowerment, economic empowerment. Um, you know, reparation, uh, redistribution of resources. If it's not built on these, then it's it's shallow and pretty much uninteresting, and and not even just uninteresting, but it, it's it's it can be harmful. Which was a similar kind of language to the way I start the book, and I was really obviously I was intentional with how I start the book because that's how I start the book <laughs> the way that I did. But I I I. The stories that I started with in the book were not actually the first ones that I encountered. I, mm. I just chose to start with them because, and for those listening, the book basically starts with two short, two, one short story and one longer one. The short one is that I reach out to a Palestinian woman in Nablus um, to ask if I can come speak to her about uh, how she thinks about reconciliation and, and dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians and so on. And she writes back and says that it's an inappropriate conversation because they're mm. being occupied so that we should talk about justice and not reconciliation. Yeah. And then that leads me into this, this conversation with a Palestinian peace builder named, uh, named Ali Abu Awad, who at one point says to me, look, dialogue is not my goal. Dialogue is a tool for my liberation. Um, and if dialogue is not a tool of my liberation, it be can become a means of oppression. Um, and, and that was so convicting to me because I can mm -hmm. remember, I, just, I know how many times I've listened to basically to well-meaning white people say, I just actually heard it again today. Um, so just basically being like, if we could all just stop being so angry and just sit down and talk together. Mm -hmm. And it, and there's no imagination for what comes beyond the talk. Like, what is the talk leading toward? Mm -hmm. And what is the shift in behavior that has to happen? It's, it's just, in, in Ali's language, the Israeli imagination, in my context, the white imagination of America tends to stop with dialogue and just says, this is what we're working toward, the ability to talk to one another. And his point was, you no, know, talking to one another is what leads us toward changing the behavior and, and making things right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Ali's story, and that's a thread that you weave throughout. Although in Eleanor's story, which oddly enough, that page that I told you about, I, bas I basically have highlighted the whole page. Um, <laughs> every, I, I realized after the fact, I'm like, there, I basically missed the commas and the semicolons. Yeah. Outside of that, everything else is highlighted. Um, yeah, her story specifically, and maybe it's because of everything that's going on right now, yeah. really, I don't know what the word is. Just was hard, hard and, yeah. Either way, it doesn't matter. So um, there's, and I don't remember what chapter it is, but you, there's a part in there, and I don't know if you say it or if one of the people that you were interviewing says it, but you say that grief, is used as a fuel 
for uh, as a weapon for peace. Can you break that apart a bit for me? Because I honestly didn't write the page number down because I can't remember exactly where it is, but, but grief being used yeah. as, as both a fuel or, or as a weapon for peace. Um, it could have appeared in a couple different places. I think it may be in the last chapter, um, which is the story of um, two men, one named Ramiel Hanan, who's an Israeli father whose daughter was, was killed, blown up by a Palestinian suicide bomber when she was just about to turn 14. And the other is a Palestinian man named Bassam Aramin, whose 10 year old daughter was shot in the back of the head by an Israeli soldier on her way home from school. Um, and I don't know if remember if they said it to me then or if I've heard them say it in other places, but clearly it's in the book somewhere. But they talk about how they have learned to use um, the power and magnitude of their grief as a weapon for, for peace. Um, and it's an interesting use of the, of the language of weapon. But it's essentially this idea that. Um, what is driving the very thing that could uh, compel them to take up arms and fight one another is actually what is demanding that they put their weapons down, you know, uh, and so they're part of an organization called the Bereaved Fam the, the Parent Circle Families Forum, which are bereaved Israelis and Palestinians who are using the power of their grief uh, as the uh, the the kind of common ground between them to say because we have lost. Um, the most that anyone can lose. We've lost our families to this conflict. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that nobody else feels that same pain. Um, and so I think it, it was a very, it was, and this also appeared in Joe Barry's story, who's an English woman whose father was killed by a, 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 an IRA bomber during the troubles. Mm -hmm. um, and so these, these themes came up a lot. And it was a very, I guess it was, a cons even if it wasn't explicit, it was a consistent theme in the book to see people who were, uh, overwhelmed with grief from living life in conflict and for being bereaved themselves, um, but who refuse to be locked into a sense of victimization and are instead using that, uh, the power of their grief to drive them to uh, make a change where hopefully people have to grieve less. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what made you choose, so you got South Africa, you got Ireland, and you've got uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, either way, that, those areas. Why those three areas? Because Conflict like this happens all over the planet. So why yes. did you zone into those three specifically? And um, one level, it's because I had, as I mentioned, I had connections there. So I've been, my family's been going to Israel since 1967. My granddad was an archeologist and a New Testament professor. Mm. Um, so I made my first trip there when I was 10 years old uh, and I've made 13 trips over the last 20 years. So I was, I had more connections there than I have anywhere else in the world. And then I lived in Belfast for grad school studying conflict resolution. So I had a lot of con or like connections in Northern Ireland. So I knew that those two places I could, I could find the conversations I was wanting to have. Um, and because I've studied conflict resolution, I teach reconciliation and forgiveness in college here in Nashville. I've studied a lot of South Africa and I wanted to, I wanted to go and see some of the place for myself. Um, and uh, I, I had some, so Desmond Tutu is a really well-known mm -hmm. figure. One of his daughters used to live in Nashville, so I knew her. And so I was able to, she put me in touch with her father and the family. And so I was able to make some connections. So there was a sense to which these were the places that I had good connections. There was another sense to which they are three places where, that are well-known, um, especially for people probably 50 and above, um, for like as places of deeply divided um, they're deeply divided societies, you know. Um, my dad said growing up, you know, he had the, there was a sense of the, the like the three Bs that you didn't go to, Belfast, Baghdad, and Beirut, I think. Um, and so, the, because, because the troubles, the conflicts in Northern Ireland raged from the 1960s till the Good Friday Agreement in 1999. So people who were, who were kind of paying attention during those years would have very much known Northern Ireland as a place of deep division. And South Africa had their first free elections in 1994. Um, and of course, Israel Palestine is still going on. So yeah. for me, it was just like, I want to go to places that I don't, that, that don't require me to convince people about the division and those societies. It's just like, we, we have a backdrop in mind. And now I want to tell you about how people are figuring out how to live there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about justice and reconciliation. Um, I hear those two intermingled almost interchangeably as people, especially lately on, you know, social justice warriors or whatever uh, on the internet that um, I honestly just think, and myself included, should just have a, hi, my name is Dunning-Kruger right on my, right on my shirt uh, and just wear it constantly. 
because uh, we're all we're all experts, right? Every single one of us. Um, so, how do you make a distinction between justice and reconciliation? Because um, I think often people conflate the two. That justice for one means that we had to have reconciled, or maybe reconciliation means that I lose justice, like I have to give up power in some way, shape, or form, yeah. or that giving up that power is a loss of justice. Yeah. It's a great question. I think I think the two are are um, at their best. They're in a very rich conversation with each other. And I think that, in shorthand, I guess I would say justice is the way we talk about how to make right um, the uh, the structures and how to make sure that that they are treating each other with equity and equality and fairness and mm. um, and. And reconciliation is dealing more with the quality of our relationship with each other, um, and uh, and I think what what ends up happening is that people do enormous damage to both when they pit them against each other. Um, and so the idea that um, well, what we really need is just justice. Who cares about reconciliation? Or what we really need is for people just to reconcile, and you know, not so much about justice. And I think. Um, what we're needing is for these two to be in a good relationship with each other because um, because reality is that neither of them uh, is a sustainable pursuit without the other. You know, like we can talk all day long about reconciling relationships and trying to build, uh, and when I talk about reconciling relationships, I'm talking about building relationships of trust, uh, of, of interdependence, of mutuality, of, uh, of goodwill, of forgiveness. Um, at these these sort of qualities, uh, but those cannot be sustained if there are active oppressions and systems of inequality that are separating people. How on earth do you build close relationship when there are things keeping you apart? Um, so you can't you can't reconcile in a long term sort of way if there's active injustice that's continuing to perpetuate throughout society. And at the same time, you can you can try to solve all the problems with the systems and structures that keep people apart. But if you don't ever deal with quality relationship between them, then those systems, then the people will find new ways to like new injustices to create. Um, right? You look at it in terms of slavery in the United States. So chattel slavery is is abolished, but the quality of relationships, the narrative of white supremacy is not addressed. So then it turns into convict leasing. Then that ends, and it turns into you know decades of lynching and then it turns into Jim Crow and then it turns into mass incarceration and it you just find new ways to tell the, to do the same thing over and over again mm. um, and so I I still find a lot of value in the language of reconciliation I think there's I think there's there's benefit to it but I also um, I'm of the firm belief that you can't have any conversation about reconciliation with integrity unless you are very much aware that it it, it cannot um, it cannot stand up straight without a foundation of justice and equity and uh, and right kind of um, uh, yeah being a, a kind of being in right relationship with um, with the way that we organize our society to to kind of uh, it's not going to be able to stand up straight without those things you know and so um, they are they are distinct um, but they are deeply interconnected I think. Yeah, um, there's a dead, literally dead center of the book. So on page 113, the, so the sentence I highlighted is you say, there's a theory in peace building that it can take as long to heal from a conflict as the conflict itself lasted. Now, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't remember the context from the pages before and the pages after that. But every time that I've read that, I actually wrote it down at my desk. I kept it on my desk. And as I pull up CNN or Fox News or whatever news source I want to read for the day, I keep hearing that in the back of my mind, haunted as I watch our country just explode. Um, and I wonder how long, like I literally want to read the Old Testament, like just how long, like for, how, like for real, how long? So can you, is, so A, is that theory like versed well, I guess in sociology or anthropology or whatever that theory needs to be versed in, I don't know enough about the conversation to have it, but does that have much ground to hold on? And if, if, if true, how do we ever work our way towards that? Because it appears that we're still in the oppressive part of the trauma. We haven't even crossed the threshold yet to begin yeah. to eat the years to resolve conflict. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the theory, the first time I remember encountering that theory is from a, a world-renowned uh, peace builder named John Paul Lederach, um, who uh, is another name you would have seen that endorsed mm -hmm. the book. Um, but he, he's been working in international conflicts as a peace builder for, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 years, anywhere from um, East Asia to Colombia to Israel, Palestine to Northern Ireland, everywhere. And so this was his, this was the theory that he put forward to say, from what I've seen, um, you can typically expect that it will take as long to really get your, to feel like you've gotten out of a conflict as it took to get in there. So 30 years to get in, you're looking at a 30 year kind of post-conflict healing kind of period. Um, and so on one level, I find that utterly overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I say, I think I say on the next page, um, let's, let's just talk about racism in America as a conflict for the sake of argument. And let's just say that that conflict lasted from the time that first Africans were in kidnapped Africans were brought here till the signing of the civil rights agreement. Um, and I think, I don't remember what it is. It's something like a period of 345 years or something like mm -hmm. that. And it's like, just as even if that were, that was where it started and ended and, we're not even close to being out of the woods yet. Like, yeah. so, to, so to, to have this sort of language, this idea of black people have all the same rights, Obama was president, everything's fine. It's just like, it's not that they're, it's not that they're being disingenuous. I just think like, you just don't, you don't understand how this stuff works. Like this will take generations to unlearn, generations to unlearn. Um, and, and what's difficult is like you're saying, how do we know when we're, on which like when we get on the other side of it are we in the kind of post-conflict thing like is this just part of the this is this just part of the healing process is going through these these really painful kind of growing pains mm -hmm. or or are we still very much in the oh yeah we're we're deeply into the conflict and it's hard it's hard to know where we are but but what on the one hand that's completely overwhelming to me on the other hand where, where it has helped me is just to say um I don't have to feel the sense of this is all going to be solved soon. Like it's this, and, and that's, there's a, there's a, a, um, a, a former archbishop named Oscar Romero, who, mm. um, from El Salvador, who, um, I think it's El Salvador, who has a prayer that said something around the, the lines of we are ministers and not messiahs. Um, you know, we, we cannot do everything. And there's a sense of liberation in that because it lets us do something and to do that something very well. And I think that's what I find helpful, which I have to be careful as I say that to not let that be sort of a white person cop out to be like, oh, well, I can't really do a whole lot. You know, it's just to say what it is for me is a challenge to be like, you're not going to be the, the savior of this. You know, I won't mm -hmm. be the white savior of the problems in America. But the call is to be like, I can't abandon the work. There is work to do but I have to hold in my mind that we are part of a much larger story um, that won't, we won't see the, the resolution in a sense in our, in, in my lifetime. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oscar Romero um, is someone that I knew nothing about until his, uh, I'm going to say the word wrong, beatification, sanctification. Yeah. I don't know what the word is, but when they, when he, when he came up as St. Romero. Um, uh, yeah. And I've had many conversations with a um, friend of the show and uh, just friend overall um, that, I don't believe worked with him directly, but worked with someone that did work with him directly mm. and has all these very similar to your book, all these stories of here's what happened. I mean, we've talked at length about it for hours. Um, and I honestly, I walked away from any of those conversations feeling like, man, I really wish I had known this 15 years ago. That mm. would have been fantastic because I think it could have changed a lot of the way that I approached life and people and relationships. And who knows what that could have been. How, how much benefit that could have had for so many different people that aren't even me and the other person in relationship. Um, yeah. yeah. Oscar Romero was somebody I didn't know about until the last few years. And yeah. It's remarkable. People should look him up. <laughs> yes. Stop right now. Hit pause, Google it, and then come back. Um, yeah. And, and actually I'll just throw that episode. We did an episode on it. We'll just throw, we'll throw it down in the show notes for people that are too lazy to Google it and just hit the button. And all. <laughs> no, um, I think there's a just Google it link or something like that. Um, so where's it at? All right. So I had referenced earlier. So it is that conversation that you had with Eleanor and I'm not going to say her last name, right? Um, the bulk of, so the, the title of that chapter is called when reconciliation means nothing. Um, which honestly, as I talk with some good friends of mine, that's what I feel like the overall mentality of America is at the moment of burn it all down. I mean, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day 
And he's like, well, I think it's too much. Like all of this is too much. I was like, I can promise you if that was my child, I would burn the world to the ground. And he's like, how can you say that? I thought you were a Christian. I was like, I am. And I would burn the world to the ground. And he's like, really? I was like, I don't, it just, it's not acceptable. Um, and there's a part in here. Um, yeah, and if, if, if it's all right, I'll just read this. Yeah. Um, so you talk about, you were in Nashville. Uh, you learned of a kind of truth and justice hearing at a local university. So you go and the first speaker is a guy, is a guy that you'll call Jay. Uh, and basically you quote him as saying, we have a problem with the culture of policing. He said, it's a scary job. I often had to walk uh, up on houses and such, and you never know what's going on. And then you go on to say, the training that we get trains you to be fearful of the people you're supposed to protect and serve. And, and then you go on to say even later um, um, in, that, in that paragraph that uh, police killed at least two unarmed black people every single week and that black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. And that we have a saying uh, that I know it's highly unlikely that I'll be indicted or convicted if I'm indicted but I would rather be tried by 12 than carried by six. Mm -hmm. And like, I literally was at a loss. I thought about that. I thought about everything that's happened. I got more angry, um, which is why, honestly, I was thankful that we had about five weeks in between this conversation because I was really angry. It just did a lot of things. Um, yeah, I didn't know how prescient your, or how timely your, all of these stories would be. Um, yeah. Because yeah, I, I they're really, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so can you walk me through a bit more about reconciliation? Because Eleanor, um, I'm going to say her name wrong, she has a lot to say about reconciliation as well. Um, yeah. You know, she's like, you know, um, one of the, either way, can you walk me through a bit of her story, what she does, kind of what she has to say about reconciliation? Because it's, it's very powerful. Honestly, that, yeah, sell, the, sell yeah. that chapter by itself. Uh, so. Eleanor, Eleanor Duploy is, um, she at the time was a youth worker. Uh, at a place called the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in Cape Town. Uh, she now is a, an executive director of, of another, um, another nonprofit in Cape Town, but I, I cannot remember the name. Um, but she, she talks a lot about her work with, with uh, the youth in, in Cape Town and how there was a, South Africa is known for reconciliation, right? It, most people who think of South Africa, if you're thinking of it in terms of the conflict uh, and, and apartheid, will think of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You know, mm -hmm. it was filmed, it was, it was broadcast across the country. It became a model for a lot of other countries. You know, um, uh, you know Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, all these names that are associated with that. Um, and it's an amazing story of being, you know, uh, of having the, the apartheid government come to official power and I think it's 1948 and for 50 years to to subjugate an entire population the vast majority of your country that was a different color than you um, and this whole system of separateness that was created and then to have a guy who spent 27 years in prison come out and decide to forgive and to not try to seek a vengeance like it's an amazing story um, but the a lot many of the young people in South Africa have been growing up feeling like, and this was what Eleanor was telling me, that there's a sense that Mandela maybe sold them out um, or um, that he didn't, they, she called them uh, anti-Mandelas, that there's, because what, what a lot of the young black people, especially of South Africa, according to Eleanor, are feeling is a sense of this new South Africa was promised to us that's supposed to be so much better, but we're still just as impoverished. Our schools are just as terrible. Like mm -hmm. we're still, we're, you know, the, the, the white people that stole our ancestors' land still got to keep the farms. Like they still have all the land that they took from us. We don't get the land back. Like it was all these sorts of things. And so um, the conversation was sort of like, it's, it, reconciliation, um, it's hard to talk about a country being reconciled when there hasn't been, uh, when it's hard to see where the efforts have been to rectify the actual wrongs that happened, you know, and um, the TRC made some really um, intentional choices that were probably good choices in a lot of ways to basically tell uh, perpetrators of the apartheid government and the violence that if they confessed, made a full confession at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and as long as their violence was for political means, that they would be given amnesty. And so, 
you know, a lot of the perpetrators of apartheid did not go to prison. There was no kind of account um, justice in the way that we might think of it. Um, and so uh, what people were needing then, I think, in, in lieu of that was to have a sense of, okay, so, so much was taken from us. How are we going to get this back? Where is the, what's the, how are you going to repair this? And, you know, we, there's a lot of conversations about reparations, but that's the root of it. It's about repairing. How do we repair this? Um, because the wrong, what, what I think sometimes people, especially people who are in power, mean when they talk about reconciliation is basically saying, can we just be friends? Can you forgive us? And then can we move on? Um, and I want to keep so this. Yeah, exactly. There's a yeah. story that Desmond Tutu tells, um, um, kind of this parable about uh, the very short version would be, um, there's a guy who has a bike, uses it for everything. He rides this bike to work. Everything he does is on this bike. Somebody comes and steals the bike. They're devastated. The guy shows back up. Um, the, the, the thief shows back up at the guy's door with the bike and says, I'm really sorry that I took your bike. Will you forgive me? And the guy says, yes, I'll forgive you. And then the thief rides away on his bike, really happy that he was forgiven. And it's this idea of like, this is what people often mean when they talk about reconciliation, but that's not reconciliation. You know, there's nothing, nothing has been reconciled here. He's gotten cheap forgiveness and he has done nothing to actually make right the wrongs that he's done. Um, and so this was, this was what Eleanor was talking about in terms of how do we think about uh, black empowerment for the people that were oppressed? How do we talk about redistribution of resources? How do we talk about repair, healing of trauma? You know, um, and, and the next chapter, another black South African named Tim Balanzi talks about a lot about the same things that there was this sense of how how am I as a black South African to feel as if my country is reconciled in this beautiful new country when I am still living in a deeply impoverished um, uh, township or you you know ghetto or whatever language you might use even slum some people might say um, whereas I can take the train into Cape Town and see these lavish white neighborhoods and so you know things look kind of like they did in apartheid. So where's the, where's the change? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah you, you tell a story in here, or I think he tells a story of like a you know, slum, but like there's like one or two working toilets for thousands of people. Um, Unbelievable. Never seen anything like that in my whole life. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to shift gears a bit. So I want to talk, you, you don't talk a lot about you in the book. So I'd like to end with a couple questions about you. So you, you weave, a little bit of, of the Bible and, and, and Christianity. And like you tell us, you talk a bit about Jesus at the beginning, and I believe you talk about Mark at the end. So I'm assuming you're a follower of, yeah. of, of the faith. Yeah. So how did these conversations and then the years since then, and working through all the other conversations, the other 50 that aren't in the book, how did that change the way um, that you do faith or the way that you see church or the role of the church or whatever word you want to give that to? Like just personally, what did that do? Yeah, um, yeah, I did grow up with a very uh, active faith. It's a very, it's a very long story. It's actually what my next book project is. So um, it's an one that I think you, book? it's an intentional book, or you're you're yeah, actually writing, a writing a this one. I'm writing a book. I'm putting together <laughs> the proposal. Now. Um, the, the current title is called "Leaving the Right for Whatever's Left," um, and um, I like the play. So on it's uh, yeah. Uh, so it's basically about how did I grow up as a, um, uh, you know, how did I grow up in the church, in the conservative Church of Christ uh, in a small rural Appalachian town, 2,700 people, um, with all the trappings of sexism, homophobia, racism, all the things mm -hmm. that happened to grow up in that. And how did I then move to marching in Palestine, being a prison abolitionist, being, you know, so an ally to LGBTQ people and trying to combat white supremacy. Like, how does this shift happen? So that's the story that I want to tell. Mm. Um, and I'm considering writing the whole book as a letter to my new son to kind of say, here's my, here's my story. Um, so all of that to say, like, this is a, it's a very long conversation we could have about this and I'd, I'd, love, be, to. I'd love to do it at some point. Um, but in short, kind of how did my, how did my views change? I don't, I don't actually know how much they changed because I think honestly it was my, it was a lot of, in a lot of ways, the foundation of my faith that led me to want to find those stories anyway. Um, so um, despite a lot of the conservative upbringing of my childhood, within my actual family, my, my dad especially was on a journey out of that way of thinking. And so it was kind of pulling us along on that journey. Mm. Um, and 
he he talked about um, Matthew 25 as um, what he called the he used to call it a cheat sheet for the final exam. Um, yeah. So the chapter in my new book is going to be called Cheat Sheet. It's all about this. So basically, he was just for those who are listening who don't know the short of it is Jesus has the disciples together and he's talking about the judgment day and just says you'll be divided up uh, and. Um, you know, I'll say, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you uh, comforted me. I was naked and you clothed me. And they'll say, when on earth did we do this? And he says, well, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Yeah. Um, and so dad said, basically, Jesus said, here's the final exam on judgment day. Here's what you're going to be asked. And what was interesting in what Jesus says is that nothing that was on the final exam had to do with what we actually believed theologically in a sense about Jesus. There were no questions about who is Jesus? Who do we believe that Jesus is? It was about where are you spending your time and who are you spending your time with? Um, and so that was all that was presented to me as a child as the foundation of the entire faith, not like the divinity of Jesus or who, who, how do we talk, who God is. It's about, um, there's a, to put it in a different way, there's a German theologian who died in Nazi Germany called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote, a, there's a book that was published after he died called Letters and Papers from Prison. And in it, he at one point says, it is of incomparable value that we come to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the suspect, the maltreated, the oppressed, the reviled, in short, from the perspective of those who suffer. And I think that's what I hear Jesus saying. It's like, that's what, this is what matters is, are you are you in community and in care and in healing relationship with people who are suffering? Um, so it's just to say like that framework has been with me since I was a kid. And it's what led me to, to do, to work with uh, people experiencing homelessness in college, to become very active in prison work for years, um, to want to be part of, of healing conflict and doing peace building. And so um, I think the stories that I heard that are recorded in this book, fit really well within the, the theological framework that I that I had. Um, and that's that's partly why I wanted to go, why I was compelled to go find them anyway, because it's the yeah. stuff that I believed and I wanted, yeah. I wanted to introduce other people to those stories. Yeah, 100% agree with Matthew 25. Somehow or another, almost the entire first year of this show, um, Matthew 25, as I went back and revisited and kind of listened back through just to do like a year in review for myself, it came up in like every show and I can't remember exactly who it was. It might've been Brad Jerzak. He's like, yeah, that's pretty much the litmus test. Like, how yeah. do you know that? How do you know that you're, how do you know that you're a Christian? You, you do these. And if you don't you do these, then I pretty much told you what to do. It's not yeah. difficult. It's uncomfortable. You're going to get dirty. You're also not going to get unclean either. You're, you're mm -hmm. entirely fine. You're mm -hmm. going to have to do something. Yeah. That's, it was yeah. the whole impetus that took me into prisons to begin with in college. Yeah. Someone, a professor said, hey, I go into prison on Saturday night for a group. Do you want to come? And I thought, you know, I don't know that I don't know that I want to show up. If there if there's a judgment day, I don't know that I want to show up and not have like there were only like five things that Jesus said to do. Like and you didn't do it. I, I want to make sure I do them. <laughs> uh, but then I ended up falling in love with the people that I met and solved the yeah. systemic issues in, in prison and and then it changed the course of my life, but yeah, it was yeah, originally I would. discipleship. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to talk about that with you. Matter of fact, that is a lot of my story and the outpouring of why I do this show. I needed an outlet to, to work through it. Um, and I'm stupid enough to do it in real time on the internet where everybody can hear it for Great. free. They don't even have to buy a book. They can just hear it. Give it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why not? Cause that's, that's what we do. So last question is a question I've been asking everyone this year. I think I've asked everyone. So, uh, and, and I'm doing it intentionally. Um, it's, it's become probably my favorite question I ask anyone. So when you try to give words to the concept of God and you're like, all right, Rowan, here we go. Uh, or Rowan, 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 Rowan. Yeah, Rowan. You know, he's like 10. He's like, who's God? And you're like, here's what God is. And you try to give words to whatever that is. So for you right now, Michael, you're like, yeah, if I was going to try to give that flesh, here's what I would say. Gosh, what a nightmare of a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a common response. <laughs> yeah. Um, what language would I give to God? Um, well, the first thing I would say is that I'm immediately struck by, uh, I first heard it from Peter Rollins. I don't know who said it before him, but the idea that whatever I end up saying about God is by definition then not God, because God is unspeakable and unknowable in fullness. So 
to even talk about God is to, is to talk about, is to not be talking about God actually. So I just like, is to be an awareness of that. But I, I, golly, I don't, this, I don't know how I would describe what God is. I think I would just say it is, God is the, I don't know, God is the, is an expanse that is beyond what we can, what we can understand. But the part that, that feels accessible to me is to think about that whatever God is, God is uh, love and God is, um, God, is, God is a desire. Wherever there is, wherever there is resurrection in the world, wherever there is life coming from death, wherever there is uh, healing and uh, hope and love in the midst of, of of difficulty and hate and and hope in the midst of despair, like that is that is God. That's where mm. God is. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to have those conversations. I'm hoping my wife will do it. She uh, she went to seminary and she and she yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be like, hey, Brittany, you take this one. Um, yeah, I tried that. I tried that, and the conversation. So every conversation I tried. It, by the way, it's a beautiful answer. I love it. Um, everyone's answer for the most part has been entirely and wholly unique, and mm -hmm. every single time have been beautiful. So it's that's why it's, I'm aware of how hard of a question it is. Yeah. Um, very aware. Uh, yeah. So. There was one time I was like, all right, I'll do these with the sun. You do whatever the conversation is. I'm not even talking about the sex talk. Like I'm just talking about, I just relate easier to a man. I'm not emotional. I'm, I'm a five. Like I don't, if it's not logical, I don't care. I don't even know why you're crying. There's no blood. This makes no sense. There are no fractures. <laughs> just take a big breath, hold it for 15 seconds. slow your heart rate down and move the heck on. Mm -hmm. So I told my wife, I was like, I'll do this with him. She's like, that's fine. Um, but you're also gonna have to like you can't do that like you can't just one and then I have to do two because I have two little girls after him. She's like it's got to be some kind of fairness here. So this never really works out well ever ever. So yeah, um, I find though if you ask your son that when he's older, he'll have a much better answer than you. At least yeah. mine. At least mine do. They're brilliant. Yeah, that's the best way I can give. So plug the places, Michael. Where would you put people to get the book? Um, to get involved in some of these stories, like literally as they're reading, if they're like me and they're like, oh, this is unacceptable. I have the resources to do something. I need to do something. Like, where would you, where would you yeah. send people to? Uh, if you want to get the book, my encouragement would be to buy it from your local bookstore. Local bookstores really need support right now during COVID-19. So please do that. Um, it is available in paperback, hardback, but also uh, ebook and audiobook. And I am reading the book. So if you want to get the audiobook, you can do that through Audible or wherever you buy audiobooks. Um, I'd love for people to go to my website. It's just my name, michaelmcrae.com. Subscribe, stay in touch, follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Um, if you want to support a lot of the stories in the book, um, I, I name a lot of the organizations that are in there. So you can just Google those and, and mm -hmm. kind of donate or support, whether that's uh, the Albasma Center or the WM Conflict Transformation Center or the Parents Circle or Corey Mila, whatever it might be, find whichever ones really convict and compel you, then reach out there. But my, my stronger encouragement would be uh, to do some research and, and that's what it's going to take it about what is it, what are the places in your own neighborhood, in your own cities that are doing that kind of work? So if you're mm -hmm. compelled by, if you're compelled by, you know, Corey Mila trying to do um, kind of reconciliation work in Israel, Palestine, who's doing that in Nashville, who's doing that in Chicago, who's doing that in New York? Um, and, and, and my, I, I say, I don't really want to name organizations because I think, I think the tendency that some, a lot of us who are white have is that we want people to just keep giving us the answers and yeah. we actually have yeah. to do some of the work ourselves. That's fair. So to say like, go find, go and do your research, type in into Google the things that interest you, that compel you from these stories and find the places that are local. Yeah. There are amazing places uh, uh, in the United States that are doing great work. Um, so yeah. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that answer. And I can't remember where it is, but I believe it was Eleanor as well. Again, that chapter just crushed me. She had said something to the effect of, uh, or maybe you would ask her a question, you know, how can I do this? Like, I'm a white guy. Like, I don't have always like the best voice here. And she's like, you do, because I can't go to your circles and the meetings that you're in. Sometimes I don't have the same quote unquote language, even through the same words. And so yeah. your role is to learn, do something, and then actually say something. Like, I, yep. I can't do this. It's, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to help it's totally gonna, you're gonna have to do it yeah so totally agree well thank you again so much to both you 
You're five week old, your wife, especially, because I'm aware of the sacrifice that she just made for this conversation. So thank you to all, to all of you. So yeah, yeah, thanks so much, Seth. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, good deal. Good deal. All right. So there we go. Really appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, enjoyed it. Enjoyed the um, time for reading the book and for drawing attention to it. So. Yeah, yeah. I um, Yeah, it was a pleasure. It was a, it was a joy. I don't, I don't, I've been blessed enough that publishers for the most part every day say, Hey, how about I send you this one? No, you talk to this person. For the most part, I, I usually ignore them mm. um, because I just don't have the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yours was extremely, it reminded me of another one that I did last year with Jeremy Courtney. He wrote a book called love anyway. Mm. Um, mm. It's a, uh, where's the book? It used to be right there. Um, my kids must have moved it. He has stories a lot of, so he left to to live in the Middle East and he's lived there ever since then. So like he has a different relationship with with the Muslims that he's around and that type of stuff. And yeah, yeah like his kids don't see them as other. They are fantastic cooks, great friends, mm. like aunts and uncles. So he weaves in stories of people that are um, in that, you know, Muslim conflict with yeah with the West, um, and very similar stories, but just really localized and centralized to, to all that. Um, mm. Yeah, I think you'd like it, or you should part, you can get in touch with them, so. Yeah, um, be great. Yeah, well, good deal. Thank you, Michael. Take Thanks. care. Appreciate yeah. it, all right, take care, yeah, bye. bye.